raspy, but we're done with our all-star games. We ended up losing in, in, in the championship game, but that's fine because I wouldn't have been here this morning. We would have been in San Diego for the next tournament, but it's like, well, well, praise the Lord. We, uh, we were able to, uh, to pull it out for a little bit, and then we lost in the last inning. But that's the game of baseball, and that's why I love the game. Be that as it may, this morning we will be in Romans chapter 15. As I shared, uh, we started this, this chapter last week, and we, we will have one more study in Romans 15. So in other words, we're not going to finish the chapter today. <clears throat> Just to let you know, we will be covering from verses 14 to 21 this morning. But as I shared with you last week, the book of Romans is made up of different sections. We have the introduction, we have the, the middle part, which has to do with about five different parts or sections, and then we have the conclusion. Um, well, last week we did finish that final section, the fifth section, um, that went from chapters 12 to 15, verse 13, so we covered that much. And, and that gave us the instructions for our life, Christian or, or practical Christian living. How are we to do what we're supposed to do? How are we to treat one another and others outside the church um, in our lives? And, and not just for a while, but for the rest of our lives. If you're a born-again believer, when you're reading the Word of God, it's not just for a week, for a month, whatever it is. It's for the rest of our lives. That, that when he calls us to do certain things, it's not just for a little bit. It's, it's all our lives. And so uh, how, how do we do that? Um, Paul used that section to encourage his readers to put things into practice. Um, as I've shared with you before, up until that time, uh, that section, that, that fifth section, man, we, we have been taught so many d basic doctrines throughout the book of Romans. And if you weren't here with us, you can go back and listen to them, or you can just read it on your own and, and write down all these different doctrines that he is teaching us. Um, but that's what he did throughout that letter. Knowing what we know, or knowing what the Bible says, and doing what the Bible says, as I've shared with you time and time again, two different things. Because it's easier to teach and know theology than it is to live and do theology. Um, understanding this whole concept, knowing is great, it really is, but doing is necessary. Doing is necessary, that's what we have to do because, you see, it is living and doing theology where we truly begin to see growth, not only in ourselves, but we also see growth in our families and in our church or our churches, you know? Um, if we're doing that, because when we're doing theology, when we're living and doing it, then, and, and it's happening in and around us, it literally expands and it, it, it spreads out. It has to. In, into our jobs, into our communities, into our relationships with those that may be outside the church. And that's how the gospel just keeps on going forward, guys. If we're doing what the gospel is telling us to do, what the Word of God is telling us to do, then we will be reaching other people because that's the only natural um, progression. And so let's read our text this morning. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able, able to also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points, as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any 
of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word or deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and, around, and round about to Illyrium, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as, as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. So Father, once again, we look to you and we thank you, Lord God, for our time of worship. Lord, that that would just be our life, Lord God, in worshiping you, Lord. Not because we're playing songs, not because we're singing songs, Lord, but because that's our life. And, and Lord, even as we open up your word, that this would be another act of worship on our part. To worship you for who you are, Lord. Go before us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So now that we've gotten into these, this conclusion, this conclusion is a, a chapter and a half long. It's Paul's longest conclusion. <laughs> in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, Paul takes a chapter. This takes a chapter and a half. In, in 1 Corinthians, he takes a whole chapter to say goodbye. In Colossians, he uses up a half a chapter to say goodbye. And, and, and the rest of his other letters, normally they're just a few verses of saying, hey, it's time for me to close up this letter. But it reminded me as I was looking at that and, and looking at this section, it reminded me of when people are leaving my house. Where you announce, hey, uh, we got to get going. Okay, so you get up, you stand up, and then you end up in the kitchen you know, saying, talking a little bit more, and then you end up in the hallway right there by the door. You step outside, you go to the car, and then you're talking through the window really quick. And an hour later, you're driving out from my property. I don't know if that's the way it is in your home, but that's the way it seems to be in my home. And it just reminded me of an old Mexican song. And, and some of you may, may have heard it. Most of you may, may have not. It's, and it goes like this. Dices que te vas y te vas y te vas y no te has ido. <laughs> Which is loosely translated. You say you're leaving, you're leaving, you're leaving, but you haven't left. <laughs> and it's not like Paul couldn't say goodbye. He just had a lot to say as he's saying goodbye. And, and so here, what, what he does, even though this is the conclusion part of it, he, he begins to kind of share a little bit about himself and who he is. And, 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 and it's awesome because he's giving these people a little glimpse. People have heard about him, I'm sure. He's never met any of these people for the most part. He hasn't been to Rome. But he shares a little bit of his heart towards them. Again, throughout the letter, we don't see, we don't hear a lot of Paul's personal testimony. But you know that, that it's throughout because of how he lived his life. And, and so in verse 14, he starts off, he says, Now I myself have, uh, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are full of goodness, filled with with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. And I find that an interesting statement because, again, he had never been to Rome. He, he doesn't know these people personally in that sense. Now, he may have known many in Rome and from Rome that maybe have, have passed through his life, but he had never spent any time in Rome up to that point. But it is quite possible that those in and from Rome had told Paul about their brethren. Maybe even bragged about their brethren. And Paul, it seemed like, felt he knew them almost intimately, personally, 
I don't know if this has ever happened to you that, that one of your friends is always talking about his friend. And, and, and they talk so much about them and you have conversations about them that you feel like you know them. And then when you end up meeting them, it's like I've known you for a while without ever meeting you. And that's the, the sense that I get with Paul that he had this connection with the church in Rome. But he had never been there, but he had met enough people, and those people kept on saying, dude, you got to come and visit our church if you're ever in the area. And I'm sure Paul felt like, man, I can't wait to go. And, and for him to, to be there, he knew somehow that he would be welcomed with them. Now again, he's the great apostle Paul. Of course people want to be like next to Paul and stuff, but he never puts out that air that he was ever above these guys or anything like that. And I love that about him, that, that again, he just kind of, he, he calls them brethren. He says, man, concerning you, my, the confidence that I have concerning you, my brethren, and it's this enduring term that, man, we are brothers. Even though I don't know you, I am surely persuaded. I have this confidence that you are genuine brethren. And, and again, he was hearing things from people coming from Rome or going to Rome and coming back going, bro, you're not going to believe these guys. They're, they're amazing. And so he could write to them, and then he would receive them and say what he says about them. His confidence, his, his persuasion was because he, because of what he knew of them, that they were full of goodness. They were filled with all knowledge also able to admonish. That, the word goodness, it, it means virtue, uprightness of heart and life. The example that these guys must have been to one another. He, he was able to use that word goodness, that you, you are full of goodness that there's some uprightness in your life. That phrase, filled with all knowledge, means understanding the full scope of Christian truth. He, he, he knew that they had been getting fed in such a way that they were growing. They weren't stagnant. They, they weren't just going to church to go to church. They were going because they were growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and probably it was because of their own personal relationship that they had that when they came together, they just became this, this, this union, this, this, this fellowship that other people knew about and heard about. And, and the phrase, able to admonish, means that they were able to caution, to, to reprove, and even warn one another. But they did it in a gentle way, because the inference is that. that not in a negative way, that, that you came to rebuke someone or admonish someone, but they did it in a positive way. It, it seems like they were already building one another up, instead of tearing one another down. And, and what we can gather from those that Paul was writing to was that they were growing and they were willing to be taught. They were willing to learn. No matter how long they had been walking with the Lord, they were still willing to do that. And again, I love the fact that Paul is not talking down to them. He's kind of never put himself above them. He did not have a low opinion of them. You know, that, that here, I'm the Apostle Paul. Let me go in and school you guys because you guys don't have someone like me teaching you. That guy that's there, he's all right. But man, if I was there, man, you guys would be growing by leaps and bounds. As, as, as a matter of fact, he's just going like, man, I am so blessed that, that I get to write to you guys these things that I'm writing to you. And so he didn't think of them less. If anything, he considered them to be spiritually informed and in some ways spiritually mature. 
which is interesting because some would say, then why, why did he write to them in such basic, rudimentary, and simple Christian doctrine? Why did he have to like go back to those kinds of things, you know? And Paul would, would end up saying, he said, no, I have written to them quite boldly. I have written to them quite boldly in some, in some points, in some measure, as if to remind them of these basic doctrines. There's nothing wrong with that. Knowing where you're at spiritually, there's nothing wrong with going back to basics. Again, when you look at a Sunday morning and even a Thursday night, man, you have a wide spectrum of people who are just coming to the Lord, and we have people that are way smarter than me and, and, and way more theolog, theolog whatever. They're, they're, they're just smarter. They could, they could teach at Bible classes, you know? And yet, when you stop think or when you start thinking that you've already arrived or attained to a certain place or plateau of your learning, that's a dangerous place to be because there's nothing wrong with going back to the basics and understanding even um, once more what are these basic doctrines. And I'll tell you, the book of Romans for me personally, after 40 years, 41 years of walking with the Lord, it still has been teaching me and allowing me to grow, especially when you get to the the practical parts of it. (laughs) Because again, I don't care how smart you are or you think you are, if you're that smart, you're probably not doing the practical things because your head is way up there. And again, there's a danger when, when, when you think, oh, going back to the rudimentary things is too simple for me. Be careful because you're becoming puffed up and you're thinking too highly of yourself. The Apostle Peter in his writings, did this a, a, a couple times, especially in Second, in Second Peter, in, in chapter one and in chapter three, in chapter one, verses twelve and thirteen. Peter writes this as he's writing to a wide uh, swath of people, if you will. He says, in in Second uh, Peter chapter one, verses twelve and thirteen. It says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir up, to stir you up by reminding you. And then in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. There's nothing wrong with being reminded. And I think oftentimes when people think, well, that's just too basic. I need something more. I need something more advanced. And, and I often have had those conversations with people that are going, eh, Zeke, you're just mediocre. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. I'm not, I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I understand that. There's other churches that are way more smarter. But I'll tell you something about our church, not because of me. We're very practical in how we live our lives here. And, and, and there, again, I, I've had it, for the last several months, I've had people share with me, people that have visited here going, there was something different there. And, and I got a, a huge compliment from one of the brothers that was here uh, a, a little over a month ago. It's going, I, I visit a lot of churches in your church. Was, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, I, it's like, no, no, bro. And I'm going like, well, bless your heart, man. Bless your heart. Well, bless you guys because you guys made those people feel welcomed as if they belonged here. And I love that. And so Paul, Paul says this about them, but he couldn't say that to everyone. He, he couldn't say what he's saying to these guys because he, he would say something to the Corinthians <laughs> that, that he didn't say to the Romans here. He, 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 he's writing the book of Romans from Corinth. He, he, was, he, would, if, he would be in Corinth for a, about a year and a half 
And when he would write to them later on, this is what he says to them, understanding he had already spent some time with them. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3, the first part of verse 3, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Verse 3, the first part. For you are still carnal. Paul had taught there for a year and a half. He's going, these knuckleheads, man. Now, again, they, they had learned a lot. They just weren't practicing a lot. They, they had a lot up here because, again, he goes after them. He's like, man, you, you, you major in all these spiritual gifts, but you're not doing anything, it seems like, in these practical things, which those spiritual gifts should be associated, but they were, out, they were looking at the outward of spiritual gifts in, so, in some ways. And he, and he has to kind of call them out on that. But Paul felt comfortable enough to these whom he is writing to, to say, I, I wrote more boldly to you in some points, in some measure. I, I, I was able to do that. I was able to, to, to talk to you a little deeper, in, 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 especially in telling you about this practicality stuff. And that's how much confidence he had in them. He knew that they would be mature enough to understand what he is trying to tell them. Again, they weren't perfect. They were growing, though. They weren't stagnant. They weren't backsliding. They were kind of just continuing to mature little by little. And that should be our hearts. No matter what age you, you are in the Lord, that your heart would be, Lord, I don't want to stay stagnant. We, we can be content in a lot of ways, but let us not be content in our growth with the Lord that we would desire more of Him. And again, oftentimes when people say, man, I just want the deeper things of God, I often want to just ask them, how much practical stuff are you doing? <laughs> are you loving others <laughs> the way you're supposed to be loving? Or are you just out for these spiritual highs? Because if you are, you're going to not grow. You're going to just kind of look for that next high wherever it is. So I encourage you, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ that we might do what he has called us to do. He says this <clears throat> at the end of, of verse 2, because of the grace given to me by God. You see, Paul, he did understand that the grace, the gift that he had received from God to be a minister. He, he understood that. And he never lorded it over anyone. I, again, Paul had his issues. There was times that he had conflicts. But, but by and large, he, didn't, he did not lord it over people. He never threw his weight around, even though he could have. Because even by this time, people are already talking about this Apostle Paul. This great Apostle Paul. And even though he had that, and people knew who he was, he knew that they knew where he was coming from. That he wasn't lofty. He wasn't haughty. He, he, he came down and he spoke to them, and he, he taught them, and he grew them. He grew them, and, and, and he poured into them. And, and at the beginning of the letter, that's what he says. I want to be a part of that fruit that God is doing in your life. I want to be around what God is doing with you guys. And people are like, Paul, you're the one that makes things happen. It's like, no, 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 no. You guys are making it happen. He says that I might be a minister, in verse 16, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The word that, that Paul uses here for minister is, is not the same word, Greek word, that is used in other places. The word minister in, in some of the other places that you might see the word minister, it means steward. 
deacon. It, it has that connotation to it. But here, it carries more of a priest. Those who do their priestly duties. <laughs> it, it's one who holds an office. One, it, it speaks of, of a public office or a public servant. And, and Paul truly held that kind of title. That office. As a temple priest, even though he's not in the temple, he had that authority, if you will, of one who, who was called to be a little higher in, in, in ministering to the body of Christ. And I say that he was in that office, in that position, because in a sense, he represented God to the Gentiles and the Gentiles to God. Just like Aaron back in the Old Testament. When God called him and set him apart to be a priest, it was because he would represent God to the people and the people to God. And he would be that middleman. And this, this is where Paul found himself. And he understood his calling. That he was put in that position. Oh, there was others jumping on board and God would be using them. But he was one of the ones that God truly used in the beginning. Even though God had already spoken to Peter about about Cornelius and, and those people, but, but Peter never launched that. <laughs> he, he, he went back to being more with the Jews, whereas Paul and Barnabas, but Paul in particular, he, he was the one that ministered to the Jews or to the Gentiles. And so he had that office. Knowing who Paul was at the time and then knowing his calling to the Gentiles was huge. Again, we, we might not think much about it today, but back in that day, that was a huge position for someone to be in. Most of the time when Paul was attacked in his ministry, it was because of the way he ministered to the, the Gentiles. But he understood the grace that, that was afforded to the Gentiles. He understood that. That they too, the Gentiles, had been sanctified, had been set apart by the Holy Spirit. And not everybody was thrilled about that, especially the Jews. They, they did not like the fact that, that he had left being a Pharisee to, to follow after Jesus. And then, now is he not just not a Pharisee, but he's also going towards the Gentiles and bringing them in without proselytizing them, changing them to, from, from Jews <laughs> or, or bringing them back to Judaism. He wasn't doing that. He was skipping the middleman and they were becoming Christian. But even some within the church, they were having an issue with that. They didn't accept it that readily as well. And that's why in Acts 15, there was that big old brouhaha that happened with, with them bringing Paul and Barnabas in to say, hey, li listen guys, how are we going to fix this issue? God had called him to be a minister to the Gentiles. Paul knew that they were accepted by God. And Paul was going to fight for them. Whenever there was issues, he was going to fight for them as a minister or to, of and to the Gentiles. He would continue to offer them the, the gospel, even through the opposition. Again, every time he went to a city, where did he end up? In the synagogue, because he was going to reach his peeps, first and foremost. And when they rejected him, then he went over to the Gentiles, and then they would have a hard time with him. But he was not going to, to stop. He would always offer up, offer the, the gospel to them, but he would always offer them up as well as a minister, as a priest would to, to God because he was able to minister to them in that sense. And if you look in verse 14, you notice the Trinity at work there when, when he talks about being a minister of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel of God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so you see that it was the triune God that was the one that was involved in sending Paul out, but he also used him to bring people in <laughs> and set them apart. 
And by that, they were accepted and sanctified by God. You see, it is a triune God that is involved in everything that happens in our lives. The Holy Spirit is doing the work in our lives because of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross so that we can glorify the Father who is in heaven. Now, this, this ministry <clears throat> that Paul had is not exclusive to just like guys like Paul. Paul knew his calling. But God can even use guys like me in positions like this to be a minister, to have an office of minister, if you will. And I giggle because I know me, but I also know who God, that, that God has called me. I, I've shared it with you oftentimes. I, I, I don't take myself that serious, but I truly take what God has called me to do very serious. I might joke around every once in a while because I'm a jokester. But I truly know what God has called me to. It, it, it's so funny because I, I could, I, I, to this day, I tell people, I'm a construction worker. That's what I do. I just happen to be a pastor right now. <laughs> and I just trip out because in Jan, uh, July 1st was like 22 years ago that I came on staff and left my construction tools behind. Well, I didn't, I, they, they're still in my shed, just in case God goes. <laughs> What is that guy? Is he still back there <laughs> behind the pulpit? He's like, still got my tools, Lord. I'm a little older, a little fatter, but I'll get in shape <laughs> to go back to construction if I have to, Lord. <laughs> but, but understand this, guys, that before I ever had the title of a pastor to be in this position, I knew that as a Christian, God had called me to reach the lost. Never imagine being behind a pulpit like this. Matter of fact, today, I was uh, this morning, man, as I knew the date and stuff, is 34 years ago today that we moved from Norwalk to, to the high desert. Wild, isn't it? Being in this church for 34 years. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> knock it off. But I say that because I know what God, I never imagined any of that, but God has me in this position. And I, and, and I love the fact that, again, guys like Paul, he, he never put himself above Zeke Flores. He never. He never put himself above any of these people. That, that our hearts, as we serve you, would be, let us serve you. Not that we could overlord lord it over you in any way but how do we come and do this together because i can't do it all together and so again I, I i'm just blessed that that god has called some of us to be ministers maybe with a capital m but he's called us all to be ministers with a small m if you will and he says in verse 17 therefore for this reason no, therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God, for I dare not speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in, might, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, Paul says to the Corinthians, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Again, ha having to tell the, the Corinthians, hey guys, don't boast. Don't be boasters, <laughs> but if you're going to glory, let it be for the glory of God. If we are going to glory, if we are going to boast in any way, shape, or form, any way, shape, or form, people, let us boast in what the Lord allows us to do. Some of you guys are very talented in so many different ways, and you have reason to boast because you are that talented but you would be nothing apart from the Lord. 
Oh, you, you, you might make it in the, in the, in the real world. <laughs> you, you, you might have all the accolades in the real world. But as Paul says, man, I count that as rubbish. I count it as dung <laughs> for the excellency of who Christ is in my life. And any talent, any, any boasting we might have, it is to the glory of God. And that's what Paul is saying. As Jesus said in, in, in John 15, for without me, you can do nothing. Now, I know we can do a lot of things, but it wouldn't be for the glory of God. He says, I will not dare. <laughs> I will not dare to speak of anything, of those things which Christ has not accomplished to me or through me. <clears throat> Paul was used in, in phenomenal ways, in powerful ways. We, we, we see that not only in his letters, but in the book of Acts, right? We, we see how Paul, God used Paul to reach a people that were not reached, that, that, that the Gentile or the Jews really didn't want to reach even. And yet, in everything that he was able to do for the glory of God, he says, I will not take any credit for that. He, he understood that he was not on, that he was the he was only a tool in the hand of God. He couldn't do nothing apart from who God was working in him, and he would not rob him of any glory that belongs to the Lord. The, the Spirit of God had empowered Paul to share the word of God, and, and the purpose was to make the, the, the Gentiles obedient. That is to bring them to Christ. And as he brought them to Christ, they came into the obedience of Christ. And so his, his heart is like, let me bring you, let me tell you what I know, but it is Christ who does the work. And, and, and I think a, a lot of times we, we tend to think that our church or us, we, we do the work. It's like we do nothing. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not manufactured. We can't. We, we are distributors. All, all we can do is distribute what God's already shared with us. And any glory goes back to, to God. I, I, I remember a, a pastor sharing one time, because people are like, oh man, that was amazing, that was great. And you always want to go, well, it's not me, it's the Lord, but God used you. And, and, and he, he said, and I think it was, he was quoting Corey Tim Boone or something like that, that when she ever got any accolades, she says, at the end of the day, I would gather them up as I prayed and put them in a bouquet and say, they're all yours, Lord. They're yours. I am nothing. You are everything. Because again, you know, when, when God uses you, people are like, thank you. It's like, you, you, yeah, yeah. You, or you're like, well, it wasn't me. It's like, no, it was you. God uses people like you are his his hands, his feet, his mouth. You are all those things because the Spirit of God lives inside of you, but do not steal the glory. Don't touch the glory. Give it back to God. You don't have to say it in front of him, oh, to God be the glory. <laughs> you know, it's like just take it and then offer it to him and say, here, Lord, this is yours because it all belongs to you. In your quiet place, say, Lord, if I robbed any of it, man, I am so sorry. It was by word and deed that he acted, that he did all of those things, but that's what it took. It took word and deed, and yet it wasn't because of who he was. It was because of who Christ was in him. You see, Paul not only talked the talk, but he walked the walk, and he did it correctly because, again, it wasn't in theory for him. It was all practical Christian living. He just lived out his life because of who Christ was in him. He didn't have to fake it. He didn't have to manufacture it. It was who he was because of the Spirit of God who dwelt inside of him. He just lived his life. Good and bad, he lived his life. And he was able to say, whether it was word or deed, man, it was, it was to make these people or bring them to Christ, that they would become obedient to who Christ is. There were signs and wonders. It wasn't because of him. It was because the Holy Spirit empowered Paul 
to minister. And because of that, he enabled him to perform mighty signs and wonders. But the miracles of God that, that get, God gave Paul were, were signs that came from God and were revealed by God. Paul didn't like conjure up. He didn't go and brew something up. It's like, <laughs> you know, to conjure up this miracle or these signs. It was God working in him and through him. And any of the wonders that, that happened in his life, they were to arouse the, the people in awe and wonder because of what God was doing. But there were always, if, if God used any of that, it was, it was for the purpose of always opening the door for him to be able to preach the gospel. However it was, I, I, again, w when you read through the book of Acts, we see the miracles that God did in and through the apostles. But when you look in particular to Paul, again, they were always to authenticate the messenger and the message. They were never meant, miracles and signs were never meant to be the main attraction. The gospel of God is the main attraction everywhere, all the time, period. That is what, when you're seeking out miracles and, and, and those kinds of things, you're just going from one emotional thing to another emotional thing and the word of God is not penetrating the way it should because it's all the hype. Again, miracles in and of themselves are not given to save the lost. But more often than not, miracles follow the work of God. They really do. When Paul healed the crippled man in Lystra in Acts chapter 14, the immediate response from the people that were there was a pagan response. <laughs> They didn't fall down and worship God. They, they, they wanted to make Paul and Barnabas gods. <laughs> and they tried to worship them. And when Paul said, hey, let me share the gospel with you. <laughs> it's interesting because they didn't respond enthusiastically to the gospel. Not like to the, they did to the, mirac to the miracle. As a matter of fact, the people took Paul outside the city and they stoned him. <laughs> and left him for dead. How's that for miracles, Right? It's like, so much for the miracle. What they didn't see is him getting back up. <laughs> it's like, didn't we just kill that guy? <laughs> we are never to seek out signs and wonders, guys. They follow the work of God. They follow what God is doing. And Paul was obedient to go wherever the Lord sent him. And wherever he was able to go, he went. He never sent an advanced team. <laughs> he, he, he never sent a team to go hype up the city or the crowd, you know? I, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with advertising. Nothing wrong with that. But the gospel should never be turned into a circus. Again, the gospel was never meant to be cool was never meant to be hip. It was never meant to be that. It was just meant to be simple, to save the lost. And so Paul, again, he tells us, he says, all these things happened, man, from Jerusalem all the way to uh, Illyricum. Um, I, you know, we know that, that Paul, from the book of Acts, we know that he went to Jerusalem many, many times. But we have no record of him going to uh, Illyri Illyricum. It's a hard word. I've been practicing it. I don't know if you can tell. Thank you. Ill Ill Illyricum is, is, is a province that was northwest of Macedonia where you have Greece. It would be up against the A uh, Adriatic Sea. At, at, at this point, things have changed up there. And so you have Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia, Croatia. And across from that, that sea, that small sea, is Italy there, Rome. And, and so we, we, we don't know because it never tells us that he was up there. But it's quite possible that, that when he was in, in Macedonia and in, in Greece, that maybe he, he headed up there for a little short spell. I don't know. Maybe hitting just the southern part. But be that as it may, Paul fully preached the gospel wherever he went. 
He was never on vacation from the gospel. No matter what was going on in his life, he was going to get the word out. And what we get from all of this is that you and I need to be open to share the gospel anytime, anywhere we find ourselves. Again, if God's called you to be a street evangelist, go do it. If he hasn't called you to be a street evangelist, wherever you find yourself, do the work of an evangelist. Look for opportunities. Pray for opportunities. You're going to a family function? Lord, be with us, man. Open the door. Show us what we can say or do. Going to a little league field? Be a witness. Be real. <laughs> Don't be nuts. But be real. <laughs> Again, that anything that pertains to God, that, that we would look for those opportunities. Lord, I am willing. I, I, I will do whatever you want me to do. And when you say that, he might put you in an uncomfortable position, right? Some of you guys thrive on those, man. Other people is like, oh. It's like, open your mouth, see what happens. Open your mouth. If you have this much knowledge of the word of God, Open your mouth and see what God does. Because if you've been reading, you'd be surprised what's stuck inside there. <laughs> Paul had his calling. And he was confident in others. Again, I know my calling, but I'm confident in you, people. Because I can't tell you how many times you share with me what God is doing with you outside these walls that I could never be at. And so, I, I, again, it's just exciting to see what God is able to do with those who open themselves up. And at the end here, in verse 20, he says, So I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. The word aim can also be translated ambition, strive. I strive to. But it also carries words like purpose and objective. But the statement that he's sharing right here, the, 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 the sediment, uh, sentiment behind it or underlining right here this phrase ha has this tone of honor and love to have the, the aim, the ambition there was this, this fondness for the Word of God because that, that, that phrase that I have made, made it my aim, the primary word for that big old long Greek word that's there that I'm not going to try and pronounce, <laughs> but the front part of that, I do know it's phileo. And that word phileo is a form of love or fondness that you would have for a brother or sister. He says, I have this fondness I have this aim that wherever I go, I preach the gospel. I share the gospel. And I know that people say, oh, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. In other words, we should always be that example. But I'll tell you this, you could be a great example, but use words. Use words. When God gives you the opportunity, don't clam up. Use words lest I should build on another man's foundation. I love the fact that he gives us a little glimpse here of, the, of his philosophy of ministry and, and outreach. With all the ambition that he had to preach the gospel, he would never do it on another man's foundation. If, if God was already using a, a brother or a sister over here, he's saying, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go do those kinds of things. In other words, he, he was a, a, a pioneer evangelist. It's like, I want to go to the virgin territories, if that's, if that's possible, to be able to show, share the gospel wherever uh, I can go. Now, it could mean, it, 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 there could be a little curveball here, as our text has, has implied, that nobody was building around the Gentiles. And so his heart was, I'll build on that. If, if, if everybody's building around the, 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 the Jews, I will build around the Gentiles. So that's a possibility too. And so he ends up quoting Isaiah 52, 15 in verse 21. But here's the full verse from that text. It says in Isaiah 52, 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth at him. 
For what had been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. When Paul started off this letter in Romans, at the beginning, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. Having an aim, having an ambition, a purpose to preach the gospel, is especially when there was no shame associated with it. Paul was a man who could not be stopped. <laughs> Didn't matter where he, he would find himself. If he was on the road, if he was in a city, if he was in a perverse city, if he was in the wilderness, wherever he found himself, if he was in prison, <laughs> he would preach the gospel. Any obstacle for him ended up being an opportunity to preach the gospel. If there is no shame in your game, then make it your aim to preach the gospel. I know. I wrote it down. It's like, dude, that sounds pretty legit right there. But that's how my mind works. And I wrote it down. And I thought, I'm going to use that to my peeps. And they will ooh and ah. But only for the glory of God, of course. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord God, for who you are and what you allow us to do, Lord. We are truly humbled, Lord, when we consider <laughs> who we are. When we consider, Lord God, how lost we were. And you found us, you called us, Lord. You brought us in, in our worst state, Lord God. While we were still sinners, you saved us. What a blessing that is, Lord. Lord, to have salvation is amazing, Lord God. The fact that you would even use us as you used Paul, Lord, a man who, who came after your people and you used him mightily, Lord. We want to be used mightily, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord. Those who call themselves Christian, I pray, God, that you would put them in awkward and situations, Lord, where they will have to speak up. Lord, use us. Put us in, in uncomfortable places, Lord. Take us out of those comfort zones where we want to just be an example by not saying a word, Lord God. Put us in those places that we might be able to speak your word, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would continue to grow us, mature us, Lord, in the things that you have called us to do. As individuals and as a church, Lord, help us not to become stagnant. Thank you, Lord. I pray for anyone who is in this room right now, who may be perhaps, Lord God, has never come to you. I pray that even this morning, they would cry out to you. They know how lost they are, and they need you, Lord. And so if you're here today, and you need salvation in your life, just raise your hand right where you're at, and I want to pray for you. I want, I want to give that opportunity. I know many of you would say, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I've been a Christian for a long time, but have you been growing? Father, I pray, God, that you would help us. Lord, if all of us in this room call ourselves Christian, Lord, then grow us, Lord. Enough with the, the milk. <laughs> give us the meat, Lord. Put us in those situations, I pray. Go before us, I ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, guys. I love you guys. That God would use us in mighty ways for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. God bless.